Everyone, please shut your laptops. Can you shut that? Yeah. So can you shut that? Yeah. Thank you. This is a dumb classroom. No smartphones, no smart uh, uh, computers. The only smart things here are you. OK. Uh, you folks at the back, occasionally I like to write on the board. If you cannot see what I'm writing, let me know. So I'll write larger. And is this volume too high? <coughs> yep. How do I turn it down? This is this is better? Can you hear me at the back? Perfect. OK. So in the next class, I'm going to do something very strange. I'm going to bring in a big sheaf of papers. And each one of you is going to make a little name tag. And you're going to carry that with you for the rest of the semester. Every time you come to class, you put it in front of the ta on the table in front of you so I know who you are. That way, if I just decide to randomly call on anybody to answer a question, I can call you by name. OK? So let's start. Uh, the title, oh, wait, does this work? Apparently, my laser pointer is not working. So you notice that the uh, title has a question, but it doesn't have a question mark. Because it's not really a question. It's a statement. It's how they should have a series of exclamation points, because neural networks can represent pretty much anything. It's astonishing. So that's what we're going to see today. What we've seen so far, neural networks, they've taken over most tasks, AI tasks. They give you the better than human speech recognition. They do machine translation better than most humans can. Uh, they can play games certainly much, much, much better than any human being can. Uh, they can caption images and video, and some would argue that they can do it better than most people can. Uh, they're being used for all sides of computer vision tasks, you name it. Uh, this last one is particularly interesting. There are two pictures here, and I'm hoping you can't see the caption at the bottom. One of them is an actual picture of Putin. The other is uh, a picture that has been hallucinated by a neural network. Can you make out which is what? Anyone? Say that a lot, please. The right one is what? Yeah, because it says our result at the bottom, right? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's why. But yes, I couldn't make out if, you, if I hadn't given you that. So these things are pretty amazing. Now, in all of these, what you see is this, this little black box. It takes in something, it produces something else. It takes in a voice signal, it produces a transcription. It takes in an image, produces a caption, a game state. It produces the next game state. What's in the boxes? Well, we argued in the last class that uh, all of these are essentially human tasks, things that our brains have been somewhat optimized for. And so it makes sense that whatever is in those boxes must somehow emulate the human brain. So neural networks in their basic form, they were originally sort of conceptualized as something that emulates how the human brain performs, functions. And the brain, as we know, is a massive network of neurons which look like the little figure to the left. The figure you see has a head with lots of little fibers going out. These are the dendrites. Signals come in through the dendrites. When the total input signal exceeds some threshold, the neuron fires. The signal goes down that long leg called the axon out to other neurons. So, and the brain itself is a network of such, such units. So our artificial neural net looks a lot like that. You have uh, these units, perceptrons, which emulate the neurons. And then the, the network itself is a massive connection of neurons such as these. Now the basic unit within it is this perceptron, which, uh, which performs much like the neuron itself. Uh, in the original conceptualization, it's a threshold unit. So you have many inputs to the perceptron. What comes in uh, eventually is a weighted combination, a linear combination of all of these inputs. And this linear combination is compared to a threshold. If the uh, linear combination exceeds the threshold, the neuron fires. It produces a 1. 
otherwise it produces a zero, or you might have a different convention where it produces a minus one when it doesn't fire. This is what electrical engineers call a threshold gate. How many of you here, of you here are uh, EE students, electrical engineers? There must be a significant number, right? Not very many, I'm surprised, right? Uh, typically, we have lots of people from ECE out here. So I can redraw the figure like this. Instead of having a linear combination of the inputs, which is compared to a threshold, I can make an affine combination where you have a weighted sum of all of the inputs and a negative a threshold value, a bias. So this term here, z, is an affine combination. Does anyone know the difference between a linear combination and an affine combination? Anyone? Pardon me? That's not necessarily true. I mean, I can always set it to zero, can I not? Yeah. Could you say that, say, say it aloud, please? No, that is not true. Anybody else? An affine has a constant. So a linear, uh, so when I'm plotting something of this kind, this is y, this is x, this y is a linear function of x. But if I shift it, when x is 0, if the output y is not 0, right? Oh, so when x is 0 out here, right? y is not 0. This is affine. And so we have this combination of, uh, we have the uh, z over there, z over there, which is an affine combination, which is passed through a threshold function, which outputs a 1 if the input to the function is greater than 0, and outputs a 0 otherwise. So I can redraw my perceptron, which is of this, which looked like this, in terms of the affine combination of inputs. This is what we're going to be using. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So once we do this, we realize that we can actually use other kinds of functions. The function, the threshold function that the affine combination went through uh, is just a nonlinearity. We could use other kinds of nonlinearities like a sigmoid. what you have over here. A squashing function is a function that's bounded on both sides and it's monotonic. You don't actually, you, you can have other kinds of squashing functions like the tan h or uh, you don't even have, the activation doesn't even have to be squashing. For example, the figure to the right is an activation function where the output is zero if the input is negative and it's equal to the input. If the input is positive, that goes off to infinity so obviously it's not bounded you can also have activations of that kind. So this is a generalization of the basic perceptron. But for now, for today's class, we're going to continue assuming that the activation function, the function that the affine combination is put through, is a threshold function. Zero if it's, uh, the output is zero if the input's negative, and one if it's positive, because it gives you very strong uh, uh, intuition about how the network performs. Also, it was the original definition of the perceptron. One neuron fires. We're speaking of a single neuron. There's no together over here. That's the output becomes one. That's about it, right? It's written over here, right? Uh, y equals one. My uh, laser point is not working. Y equals one if z, z, z is greater than zero. Zero otherwise, right? Or if you have a different definition, it could be minus one otherwise. So a multi-layer perceptron. That was just a single unit. 
just the basic unit that was composing our network. Now, the, our neural network itself is a large network of such uh, units. And generally, the way we'll have it is we have a, all, all of our inputs are going to feed a series of these perceptrons. The outputs of these perceptrons are going to be input to another set of perceptrons. The outputs of those will go into yet another set of perceptrons. So you can think of these as a network, which is kind of directed input going in one, one side, the output goes out the other side, comes out the other side. And typically, these network structures are layered. They don't have to be. But we like to think of, we like to have these layered structures because they are uh, convenient in many different ways. And uh, the brain, of course, is not layered in the same way. Now, what I mean by layered is all the neurons within a particular layer do not communicate with one another. They communicate to the layer, the next layer, right? So now, these networks are deep. Now, what do I mean by deep? When we speak of deep neural networks, I'm calling this deep learning. Obviously, there's a notion of depth. So what does it mean to be deep? Even if I, before I begin speaking of, of deep neural networks, I can talk about deep graphs, because if you look at these figures, they're just graphs. So does anybody know what it means for a graph to be deep? Some of you must have taken graph theory, yeah. Go ahead. More than three? Three halves. Is that, is that any distance? So when you speak of graphs, you always speak in terms of these networks. You can think of these in terms of graphs. And directed graphs. Directed graphs have sources and sinks. And in a directed graph, you have various paths from source to sink. The length or the longest path in terms of the number of edges traversed is the depth of the, is the depth of the graph so here to the figure the figure to the left i have a, a directed graph this, there's a, a a path which has only one hop from source to sink but i have another path which has two hops and so the depth of this graph is two it's not one the figure to the right i have a path which is just one hop i have a path that's two hops i also have a path that's three hops the largest left path, the longest path is three hops. So that's a, uh, the depth of the graph is three. And uh, we will say a network or any graph is deep if the depth of the graph is greater than two, at least three. So here, this network over here, if you go back here to this figure here, you'll see that the path, the, the length of the path from the input to the output is three edges. There's no, the, the longest path. So the, this is a deep graph. The one to the right is also a deep graph. These are deep neural networks. By definition, a deep neural network is where the number of edges that the large, the, the slowest message takes to go, go from the input to the output must be, must be at least three. So if I have just one, la one in initial layer and then an output layer, so if there are only two layers, it's not a deep network. Now, in the multi-layer perceptron, inputs can be real or they can be Boolean stimuli. The outputs in turn can be real or Boolean. And uh, you can have vector outputs, multiple outputs for a given input. So this is the general structure we saw even in the last class. What can these networks compute? We, what kind of input-output relationships can they model? We saw an inkling of this in the last class as well. We know that they can approximate any Boolean function. In fact, it's not approximate. They can model any Boolean function to arbitrary uh, exactly. We also know that they can approximate any real valued function to arbitrary precision. But there are some limitations which relate to the size of the network and the nature of the function itself. What are the limitations? So this is everything that we saw so far in the last class. Now today, we are going to pick up from there and we're going to show that, this talk about four topics, multi-layer perceptrons as universal Boolean functions and why depth matters, uh, MLPs as universal classifiers and why depth matters again, and MLPs as universal approximators. Again, here we're going to discuss the trade-off between depth and width and how these, how these affect the network. And time permitting, I'll talk about radial basis fun net functions 
but the reality is time won't permit. I'm not going to talk about it. I make up for this by just asking you questions in the quiz. So, <laughs> so let's look at the first topic, MLPs as universal Boolean functions. How well do MLPs model Boolean functions? We know that they can model any gate. We've seen this in the last class. In these figures, the number shown above each edge is the weight of the edge. I'm using the original comparison of the total input to a threshold. The number inside the circle is a threshold. The neuron fires if the total weighted input is at least equal to the threshold. So you can see that the, the uh, uh, perceptron to the top left actually models an, what gate does it model? It's an AND. Because the threshold is two, both X and Y have to be one or it's not going to fire. The one to the right is clearly a not because when X is one, the total input is minus one, the threshold is zero, it's not going to fire. If X is zero, the total input is zero, it matches the threshold, it's going to fire. And the one at the bottom similarly is an OR, right? But it's not just this. You can model things that are much, much, much more complex. So here, this figure here, is what we will call a universal AND gate. This perceptron has N inputs, and it will only fire if the first L inputs are all one, and the remaining N minus L inputs are all zero. Can you see why? Because the weights for the lower ones are all minus one. If any one of them turns, to turns on to one, it's going to subtract the total input is going to be less than, less than L. If any of the first L is a zero, the total input is also going to be less than L. So you can have, now this is a far more complex you know, function than just an AND, right? So this is a universal AND gate. It's also a universal OR gate. So this one, for instance, is going to fire if any of the first L are one or if any of the remaining are zero. Can you see why that happens? To see how this happens, look at the one condition under which it cannot fire. The first L must all be zero, the remaining must all be one. When that happens, what is the total input that comes in? When that happens, the total input that comes in is going to be, the first L are going to give you zero. There are N minus L remaining inputs. If they're all one, you're going to get a total of minus of N minus L you have to put it, the threshold is one greater than that. So under that condition, it's not going to fire. If any bit flips, the sum is going to be greater than that value, it's going to fire. So this is a universal OR. It's a pretty powerful machine, right? Uh, here's something else you can do. You can say, then have the perceptron fire if the at least K of the inputs are one. This is what we will call a universal a majority gate, a generalized majority. one, or some specific minimum that number of inputs are one. And that's set simply by setting the threshold to be the total number of inputs that you want to be one. Very easy, right? So this is something now, this majority gate is being done by a single perceptron. If you wanted to construct the same thing using a, uh, just Boolean gates, and, or, and not, the majority function will require an exponential number of gates. It's being done by a single Perceptron. So this is the, the power of this uh, this machine is pretty uh, you know is pretty large, and this is what actually fooled Frank Rosenblatt into thinking it could do anything. And the problem, of course, is that it cannot compute an XOR. We saw this. Now we'll see why this is so in a little bit, but this cannot compute an XOR. You can try it out, and if you spend the amount of time you will spend on this trying to make this work, is the amount of time you will waste in your life. So. Uh, but you can build it using a network of perceptrons. The one on top over here computes X, and X or Y. The one at the bottom computes not X or not Y. As you can see, the final one adds the two outputs. This is an XR. So this is being done with a network of three perceptrons. The two perceptrons in the middle form what are called the hidden layer. They're hidden because you don't actually need to see their outputs. You're only in interested in the output of the final perceptron. So these are hidden to you, or could be hidden, without affecting the overall, uh, overall uh, uh, operation. 
So once you realize that you can begin composing more complex functions that a single perceptron cannot compute, you realize that you can compute pretty much, construct pretty much any Boolean function at all, because obviously Boolean functions are composable using Boolean gates, and Boolean gates are composable using perceptrons. In principle, you could be doing this using far fewer perceptrons than Boolean gates, because a perceptron can do more than a Boolean gate can. So MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons, are universal Boolean functions. They can compute any Boolean function. But and not only that, so what I mean by a universal Boolean function is you can compute a function over any number of inputs and any number of outputs. You give me the Boolean function, I can construct an MLP that will compute it for you. But you'll observe over here that in order to compute this hideous function on top, where over four inputs, this MLP actually has, how many layers does it have? Three, right? How many layers will a MLP require to construct an arbitrary Boolean function? And my contention is that you need only one hidden layer. You, it doesn't matter how complicated the function is, you will need only one hidden layer. And why is that? That's because what is a Boolean function? A Boolean function is just a truth table, correct? I can list out all of the inputs, I can list out the output. For every combination of inputs, I can give you the output. I don't need to give you the entire truth table. I only need to give you the set of inputs for which the output is one, for the rest the output is implicitly zero. So this Boolean function over here is this truth table over here is a Boolean function, and there are exactly one, two, three, four, five, six conditions under which the output is going to be one. So now I can write a DNF formula for this truth table. For every row, I can write one, one little AND, it's a single AND clause, which says, for example, for the top row, the output will be one if x1 is zero, x2 is zero, x3 is 1, x4 is 1, and x5 is 0, which means the clause is not x1, not x2, x3, x4, and not x5. So I have, since there are six rows in this truth table, I'm going to have six clauses. That's my DNF formula for this entire Boolean function. Once I write it like so, it's very trivial for you to see why I can compose the whole thing using just one hidden layer. I'm going to have one perceptron for the first clause, one for the second, one for the third, one for the fourth, one for the fifth, one for the sixth, or the lot. And so with one hidden layer, I can compose my Boolean function. It doesn't matter how complex the Boolean function is. It doesn't matter how, how uh, uh, big it is. I can compose it using just one hidden layer. So any truth table can be expressed in this manner, which means that a one hidden layer multi-layer perceptron is a universal Boolean function. You don't even need two layers, two hidden layers. That's pretty impressive, but then if I'm going to try to do this with only one hidden layer, how many neurons will I require, how many perceptrons will I require in that one hidden layer? To understand this, let's look at the entire truth table in a different way. How many of you are familiar with the notion of a Carnot map? One, two, three, four. A very small number, that's surprising, right? If you're an electrical engineer, you've done Carnot maps. Uh, what is a Carnot map? It's a topological representation of uh, bit patterns. So this square over here, it's a grid of 16 squares. Now, if you go across the columns, you will observe that uh, if you, any two adjacent columns differ in only one bit, the two columns at the ends are actually touching, so it's a cylinder any two rows also differ in only one bit. So the, two, the top row touches the bottom row. So the whole figure is a toroid, although I've sort of opened it into a square, and two adjacent squares are going to differ in only one bit, right? So this, each square in this, in this, in this little uh, four cross four grid represents one input combination of four bits. And the highlighted blocks are all the input combinations for which the output is one. Everybody get that, right? And so because this has seven highlighted blocks, 
This is going to require, if I just write a DNF formula for it, this is going to, the lady there, can you shut your laptop? Thank you. And you too. Right. So since there are only seven highlighted blocks, the DNF formula is actually going to require seven clauses. Right? Now, but then observe something. I can group these blocks. If you look at the column to the extreme left, for all four combinations of, combinations of Wx, the output is one, so long as y and z are both zero. So that means that they, I have one single clause in my DNF formula, which, is, which says not y, not z. I can completely ignore w and x. So this grouping allows me to, ha, ah, this works. This grouping allows me to write this one formula over here, not y, not z, right? So also this guy is one where uh, w and x are fixed, y is fixed, but z is both 0 and 1, so which means I can eliminate 0 from the combinations. So that gives me the formula not y, not w, x, not y. Similarly, I can group these two guys. In fact, I can group all four corners, and it's going to give me a third clause. And so now this entire truth table is being expressed with a, by a DNF formula that has only three clauses, and so my uh, uh, MLP will only require three neurons in the hidden layer. So which tells me that so long as I can begin grouping things in the Carnot map, I, I don't need to have one perceptron for every co input combination. I can have far fewer input combinations that actually give you an, a one, right? What is the largest such network? Under what condition will the corresponding network have the largest number of neurons in the hidden layer? Yes. Absolutely, right? I can't group anything. And because I cannot group anything, this network is going to require eight neurons and the head layer. If you add any more, then you can, you, know, you can begin grouping things. This is the worst case over here, right? So in uh, a DNF formula, how many neurons will I require for a one hidden layer MLP? as many as I have red squares, which is eight, right? So here's another one. This is a three-dimensional version of a, a Carnot map, which actually is defined for six variables. Again, this is a, a toroid in four dimensions. These two faces touch each other. These two faces touch, touch each other. These two faces touch, touch each other. And every two cubes differ in only one bit. So this has 64, uh, because each row represents, each dimension represents two bits, right? Two inputs. So this cube has 64, uh, this big, big cube has 64 subcubes. So there are, it represents 64 uh, combinations of bits, of which 32 are one, and no two touch each other. I cannot group anything. So how many neurons will I require in a one hidden layer, in the one hidden layer, if I want to do a one hidden layer MLP for this one? 32, 32 right? So I can generalize this. If I have n inputs, in the worst case, I'm going to require two raised to n minus one neurons in the one hidden layer. It's exponential and the size of the input if I want to represent this using just one hidden layer. So although I can do it exactly, it's going to be exponentially large. Clearly not, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll see why. If I use multiple layers, what will happen? How can I reduce this? Does anybody recognize this pattern? What is it? This checkerboard. Well, I'll give you the hint, right? I'll give you the answer. It's XOR, right? It's Yes, chess, that too. <laughs> but it's W, XOR, X, XOR, Y, XOR, Z, the first one. The second one is U X or V X or W X or Y X X or Y X or Z, and how many neurons do I need to represent an X or? Three, right? So only three. In fact, it turns out I can do it with two. I can actually do it using this network over here, but but we'll continue to assume that you can do it with three. It's up on the slides, which I refer to. It. It's pretty cool, right? Uh, now that means this guy can be done in this manner, right? 
I can give, I can use XORs, and how many XOR, how many uh, first I compute the XOR of W and X, I compute the XOR of the output with Y, I compute the XOR of that output with Z. There are three XORs. I need new nine neurons, which is the same as when I just do the DNF formula. So here maybe you don't see the difference, but when I get to this one here, uh, I'm going to need only 15 perceptrons for my XOR uh, for my XOR based network. I will need 32, 33 for the uh, one layer network. And as the number of inputs keeps increasing, this difference is going to be very large, right? Now keep in mind that more generally an XOR of n variables is going to require only three times n minus one perceptrons. Because to add each new input, I just need three neurons, right? This means again that a single, if I use a single hidden layer, I'm going to require an exponential number of neurons to model the function. But if I begin going deep, if I begin adding layers, I just need the number of neurons is linear in the size of the input. That's a tremendous difference. That's why you need depth, right? Now let's get to it a little more. Let's look at it a little more finely, okay? I can rearrange this network in this manner, right? I can take XORs of every pair of inputs, and then I'm going to have some outputs. I can take XORs of every pair of those outputs and keep doing this. And when I do this, because each XOR needs two layers, I'm going to use two times log two of n layers. That's the depth of the network. And it's still the same number of neurons. I've just arranged it differently, right? But this is the best case in terms of depth. I cannot go shallower than this and still compute the XOR, right? So. If I do this, I can still do this with something that's linear in the number of layers. But now suppose I tell you that, let's not say uh, one hidden layer. Suppose I tell you I'm not letting you do, I'm allowing you to have more than one hidden layer, but you cannot have more than three hidden layers. But I fix the depth of the network. Then how many neurons will I require? So if I look at it, the best case is going to be this guy, right? So it means because I've arranged everything and every two layers gives you a bunch of outputs over which you're computing an XOR again, after you get to the allowed number of layers, D, what remains is still an XOR. And at that point, you're going to need an exponential number of neurons from that point on, right? So which means that reducing the number of layers below the minimum, which is log two, two times log two of N, is going to re result in an exponential gro growth in the number of neurons required for the, uh, to, uh, to uh, compute the function. And if you decide I'm not going to use that many neurons, if you use fewer than the minimum rec uh, required number of neurons, you cannot compute the function. Not only can you not compute the function, you're going to be wrong 50% of the time. It's going to be the crappiest network you ever built if you just drop one neuron from that network. Right? So uh, you see where the, where, how depth matters and why it's important. And the depth, optimal depth, actually depends on the size of the input. Now, uh, the actual number of parameters in the network is not the number of neurons, it's the number of connections. So here in this example, there are 30 connections. As you can see, there are six neurons connecting to six. six so uh, five, six, 30, no, this is, this is rubbish, it's got to be, Five, yeah, six in neurons connecting to five. So that's 32 connections in reality, right? Uh, it's, this, is, this number is what really matters in software or hardware uh, implementations. Networks that require an exponential number of neurons are going to require a super exponential number of edges. The networks are gonna be really large. So to recap, deep Boolean MLPs that scale linearly with the number of inputs can become exponentially large a free cost using one, only, only one layer or even any pre-specified finite number of layers. And it gets worse. It doesn't just have to be the XOR. It could be any function that you're trying to compute. Any function you could try to compute can have a preliminary sequence of operations after which you get a set of XORs. At that point, if you limit the number of layers from, from there on, you're going to have an exponentially large network. So which means uh, just having a few extra layers can greatly reduce the network size uh, 
the amount of computation you perform, the amount of power you consume, and a great many other things. So the XOR is really just a parity problem. And it turns out that it's been beaten to death. Uh, what we say when they say that the XOR cannot be computed using a finite depth network is to say that the XOR cannot, does not really depend on this class of circuits called AC0. AC0 is arithmetic circuit order zeros, which is to say the depth is finite. It's only if the depth, the depth of the circuit depends on the size of the input that you get, you're gonna get a, a reasonable sized network. And a more general the theorem is this one by uh, for Sachs and Sipsa, where they say that uh, a parity circuit of depth D using a Boolean gates must have a size two raised to n raised to one over D, which is again, basically what you're seeing, right? Uh, now, and it actually gets even more interesting. It turns out that the XOR is really, although I presented the XOR as a worst case, it really isn't. The XOR is actually a very nice malleable function where I can get away with a linear number of, uh, the, the number of neurons can be linear and the size of the input. It actually turns out, this is a very nice uh, theorem by Shannon which says that uh, for large n, there's at least one Boolean function that requires two raised to n divided by n neurons. In fact, it turns out for large n, the majority of, I mean, close to 100% of the Boolean functions will require these many neurons. So it's, uh, but fortunately we don't deal with these hideous functions. Most times you can actually express the function if you can, then you can build a network of finite size. So in summary, and uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, so this exponential number of neurons is required even if we don't bound the depth? Yeah. Okay. Like the, even if we do the best we can, we'll still require exponential number of neurons. There's a little bit of caveat to it. Although this is what the theorem states, it's also a fact that we can't actually specify the function. Why is that? Uh, it's because if you want to write a really complex Boolean function for very large n, you can't write it. Right? If you can write it, you're specifying the function in a finite number of bits. You can have a circuit of finite size. The majority of the functions can't even be written. Right? So. Why is it that the n, n doesn't matter? I mean, uh, regardless of the depth. There are papers up on. Uh, the course web page, take a look. Right? Uh, yes. Just one thing, just one final thing. Like, what did you mean by you can't write it finitely, the function? I mean, why can't we write that? Finitely? Just being able to express these functions for large n, huh. right? If you have thousands and thousands of clauses. If you have n inputs, then you have how many clauses can you get two raised to n? Oh, okay. Right? So just, uh, anyway. Uh, it's, uh, so the optimal width and depth of the circuit, so uh, the MLP can represent a given function only if it's sufficiently wide, if it's sufficiently deep, and the depth can be traded off for an exponential growth in the number of neurons. The optimal width and depth depend on the number of variables and the complexity of the Boolean function itself, where the complexity is the minimum number of uh, DNF of, uh, terms, formula, uh, uh, clauses in the DNF formula. And it turns out that finding the uh, the uh, DNF formula with the smallest number of clauses it's a, is itself a challenging problem. Right? Now, so that's the story so far. MLPs are universal Boolean machines. Even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal Boolean machine. But a single network layer network may require an exponential number of neurons. Deeper networks may require far fewer neurons than shallower networks to express the same function, but they could be exponential, and, and they can actually be exponentially smaller. Right? There are some caveats over here. Uh, one, of course, is that you know the XOR is probably not the best example. It's only be, I'm using it as an illustration. The second is that in all of my explanation, I've used Boolean circuits. But what we are really looking at is threshold gates, which are much more powerful than Boolean circuits. It turns out that if I use threshold gates, then uh, I can comp the uh, corresponding circuit is called a TC, a threshold circuit. I can compute, uh, com I can compose a depth two threshold circuit with only n squared, order n squared edges to compute the parity function. So the parity function is actually a very nice function for threshold gates. You can even go smaller. But more generally for large n, for most Boolean functions, a threshold circuit that's polynomial in n at the optimal depth can end up being exponentially large. 
if you reduce the depth. So again, Tc0 will require an exponential number of function, uh, uh, exponentially sized network to represent uh, all possible functions, right? Now, other formal analyses of these kinds typically view neural networks as arithmetic circuits, which compute polynomials over any field. And the one that's most interesting to us, because that's what you deal with in real life, is the field of reals. Most of the neural networks that you're going to be modeling, uh, building, are not going to be working on Boolean inputs. They're going to be working on real inputs, right? So let's look at your MLPs as universal classifiers working on real inputs and the need for depth. Now, this is, again, something that you've seen. Uh, an MLP, when you think of the MLP as a classifier, the uh, uh, MLP is operating over, 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 uh, over the reals. And let's say you build an MLP to classify digits. Then what you're going to be presenting to the MLP is a uh, large vector of pixel values. For example, if you were doing MNIST, that's going to be something like a 784. It's a 70, each image has 784 pixels. So if I open it up, that's 784 numbers that I'm representing to the network. So it's actually looking at a 784 dimensional input. And the decision boundary, which decides which uh, input patterns represent the number two and which ones don't, is going to be some kind of an outline, some kind of a, it's going to be, the boundary is going to be some kind of an outline in this 784 dimensional space. Maybe something that looks like that, uh, hypothetical 784 dimensional peanut, right? So what we really want is a function that operates on 784 dimensions, which produces a one when the input is inside the peanut and zero outside, right? Now, as we saw in the last class, if I have a perceptron of this kind where, which fires if the linear combination of inputs exceeds or equals or exceeds the threshold and doesn't otherwise, it's got the boundary where the output goes from zero to one is a hyperplane. In the case of two-dimensional inputs, it's going to be a line. And so the actual function, if you plot it in all n plus one dimensions where the n plus one dimension is the output, is going to look like a step. There's a hyperplane on one side, the output is all zero, and then it goes up, at the hyperplane it jumps up, and then the output becomes a one. So it's going to look like the figure to the bottom right. Now, so this is a linear classifier. The boundary between the one and the zero is a, is, is, is a, is a hyperplane, it's linear. And so the, uh, it's affine, but we'll call it a linear classifier. And I'm calling it a linear classifier because for some combinations of inputs, the output is zero, for others it's one, right? But once you do this, you realize you can why you can compose Boolean functions. So look at this. This, the four dots, if I'm working on two inputs, the four dots represent the two combinations, all four combinations of two bits, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 1, right? If I construct a perceptron with this boundary, the one to the, to the left, that's going to output a 0 when the input is 0, both inputs are 0. It's going to output a 1 for all other combinations. What is that perceptron? That, that's an OR gate, right? The one to the one in the middle, that's obviously going to output a one when y is zero and zero, if y is one, it ignores the x. That's a not y. The one to the right, what is that function? Ignore, not ignore. That's an XOR, right? It on, you want the output to be one for either zero, one or one, zero. And do you see why that cannot be modeled by a perceptron? Because you want the function to go up and then go back down. And the perceptron can't do that. Once it goes up, it stays up, right? So which is why an XOR cannot be modeled using a single perceptron. But again, once we realize that you can construct boundaries of this kind, we saw how we can put these things together to compose more complex decision boundaries, like this pentagon. You want the output to be one when the, when the input is inside the yellow region, zero outside. So the way, way we would compose it, we would have one perceptron which captures this lower boundary. That's going to have a zero at the, below the boundary, one above. The second one is going to capture this other boundary. The third one does this guy. The fourth does this. The fifth does this. So what happens? It's only inside the pentagon that all five of them are producing a one. Everywhere else, at least one of the perceptrons is producing a zero. So if I just sum all of the five outputs, 
the sum is going to be a five only within the pentagon and zero everywhere else, right? and less than five everywhere else. It's good, maybe four, maybe three, maybe two, but it's definitely not going to be five. So if I have a final perceptron on top, which simply sums the five inputs and compares it to a threshold of five, this network is going to produce a one when the input is inside the pentagon and zero otherwise. So I have captured this pentagonal decision boundary, right? Once I do this, I can do more complex boundaries of this kind. So now I'd have one set of five neurons for the first pentagon, the other set of five neurons for the other pentagon. So now one subnet for the first pentagon, one, uh, another subnet for the second pentagon, and the final one is an R, which ensures that the input fires if the input is either inside the first pentagon or the second one, which means now I've got this crazy double pentagon decision boundary. And of course, if I can compute a double pentagon decision boundary, I can do other, other crazy decision boundaries of this kind. And the way I would do it, of course, is very simple. Say I want to do this crazy figure to the left. I don't even know that if that shape has a name, but what I can do is to fragment it. And I can compose one subnet for every little component and or the lot. And it's going to produce an one when the input is inside that uh, crazy decision boundary, but not otherwise, right? So what this means is that this MLP can compose arbitrarily complex decision boundaries, including things that look like horses and human beings. But my claim is, I can do it with only, with only one hidden layer. So let's, let's not look at these extremely complex things. Let me give you this very simple figure, this double pentagon. I want to compose this decision boundary for this double pentagon using just one hidden layer. So can you think of how? Anyone want to take a guess? Any volunteers? Yes? It's not linear because I have threshold functions, right? Does anybody think it's even possible? Yeah. Just take the each each to the left picture and and use one neuron to represent. Yeah, but you can't just if if I just put ten edges then uh, you're going to get other regions where the sum, what is the threshold you will use? Regardless of the threshold you use, you're not going to get the double pentagon, right? So from all the blank faces, I can understand either that you're not thinking about the problem or you, are, you're, or you, ha you, can, you can't come up with a solution, mm -hmm. right? I'm going, to take the, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to assume it's the latter, I'll give you the solution. Let's start off with this square, this diamond. I can compose a diamond using four hidden neurons, correct? But what's interesting is not what's inside the diamond. What's interesting is what's outside the diamond, four. See the regions which have four. Now, why could I not do this guy with one hidden layer? Suppose I got five uh, perceptrons for the first pentagon and five perceptrons for the second pentagon. You see those little slits, the regions between the two pentagons? Both pentagons, both subnets are going to be composed, uh, are going to be producing an output of four in that area. The actual sum will be eight. So regardless of the threshold you use, you're going to be filling up regions which you don't really want to fill up, right? So, and so here, uh, when I have a diamond, the sum is four inside the diamond, it's three outside and in big infinite area strips, right? But then let me go up to a pentagon. If I go up to a pentagon, the sum is five inside the pentagon. It's four in some regions outside, three in other places, and two in yet other places. The area where the sum is four, so that's the, the figure to the right, shows you the total sum. It actually shows you the sum of the uh, output of the first hidden layer, right? And you can see that it's five inside the pentagon. You have the star-shaped region where the sum is four. And that area has suddenly gone to be fine, got become finite, as opposed to when I had a diamond where the area was infinite, right? This should already tell you where I'm headed. If it doesn't, let's look at a hexagon. That's the sum over there to the right. The sum is six inside. The area where the sum is five 
has become even smaller in comparison to the area where they, you know, the region where the area is 6, right? If I go out to a heptagon, there's area, where, region where the, the sum is 6 is smaller still. As I keep increasing the number of edges, what do you get? It begins to look like a cylinder, right? In the limit, this is with 64 sides, you can see what happens. I mean, this my plotting software hasn't done a very nice job, but you can see what's happening. And in the limit, you're going to get, this is a thousand sides. You can see it's getting smoother and smoother. This increasing the number of sides reduces the area outside the polygon that have, uh, where the sum lies between uh, n over 2 and n, that area keeps decreasing, right? And the overall function, if you actually write it out for very large n, this is what it looks like. It's going to look like this, like this uh, almost bell curve, but with the top sliced off. And so you get a perfect circle for large n inside the bell, and it's going to be falling off very steeply to n over 2 outside. So, uh, and if the radius is small enough, this is an almost perfect cylinder, which means I can think of it as more or less being a cylinder, right? This is a perfectly reasonable, uh, this is basically what the function actually looks like. But now, here's what happened. I have all of those neurons. The sum of those neurons is a cylinder, right? If I took another network, and, and uh, the cylinder has n inside the circle, n over 2 outside. So let me normalize it. I can subtract n over 2, and now it's, one, it's, it's n over 2 inside the circle and 0 outside, right? Suppose I took another network of exactly the same kind, but with a cylinder in a different location, and I summed the two outputs. What would happen? I'm going to just end up with two cylinders. Because it's zero outside, they don't interfere, right? One subnet produces a bunch of values whose output becomes one cylinder. The other subnet part produces another bunch of values whose output becomes another cylinder. I add those two values up. The sum is going to be two cylinders and zero everywhere else, right? And now if I took a threshold and sliced it at n over 2, if I took a threshold at n over 2, I'm actually going to get a decision boundary that's two disconnected circles. Now, this didn't look obvious when we started off. This means that now I can actually model my double pentagon by filling it up with circles. This is not exact. This is an approximation, right? But I can make that approximation arbitrarily precise by making the circles smaller and smaller and uh, packing them closer and closer together, yes. Go ahead. Subtracting n over 2 doesn't, it's not the fact that it's n over 2. It's that, you know, you have all of these other values between n and n over 2, which add up. And what happens when you take infinite size is that the area where you have a value that's neither n nor n over 2 becomes almost 0. Right? Make sense? Yeah. Yes. Pardon me? It's not smooth. I mean, this is the limit, right? So uh, uh, it's not going to be, it's an approximation. The approximations are going to have a ugly boundaries. It's just that you can make it arbitrarily precise. So if you give me an epsilon, I can come up with an approximation that's within epsilon of the correct function everywhere, regardless of what the epsilon is. That's all, right? Yeah. So what is the difference between this approach and the earlier part? So the point is when you have, there are some kinds of shapes that you can model exactly. Other kinds cannot be modeled exactly using just one hidden layer with a finite number of neurons. That's just the nature of the function itself. So there you actually have to expand the uh, number of neurons. So this is the general case. Pretty much anything can be built in this manner, right? This is the universal approximator. Right? Yes.
Exactly. So this thing has got an ex, uh, an exponentially large and an almost infinitely large hidden layer, right? And the number of neurons in the hidden layer is going to depend on the error that you're willing to tolerate. So MLPs can capture any classification boundary. A one-layer MLP can capture an arbitrary classification boundary with arbitrary precision. And that's pretty powerful, right? They are universal classifiers. So what about this niche notion of depth? Deeper networks require far fewer neurons, right? This double pentagon needed infinite neurons to be arbitrarily precise. And even then, you know, you're not going to be exact. Whereas if I just added one more layer with just 10, 12 neurons, I nailed it. So you see how depth actually figures, right? Now, formal anal again, optimal depth again, formal analyses view these as a category of ar arithmetic circuits. Uh, and uh, there are a whole bunch of papers about how depth trades off with, uh, with. I'll skip these details, but I suggest you actually take a look at these papers. They have some very nice uh, uh, explanations, mathematical explanations for how the whole thing goes on. Now, uh, the optimal depth in terms of generic nets, let's take a look at a different pattern, worst case decision boundaries using threshold activation networks. So here is a uh, checkerboard, right? Yeah. Could you explain, like, how did you combine the circles? I didn't understand. We didn't combine, so this, here, if you take a look, this guy is computing one circle. This guy is, this is, this is computing all the edges of the first circle. If I add them up, I'm gonna get a cylinder. Uh, and which is n inside and n by two outside. For or, or n over two inside and zero outside, right? Okay. And so this guy is going to do the same thing. I just, instead of having two separate subnets, if I just add the, add the set together. Where are you doing that minus n by two? That's in here, I actually showed this. I added this little bit over here, right? Achha, it's, it's flow. It's this, the, this one is just subtracting the n over two. Achha, is it like a bias or something? Yes, yeah, so that's a bias. Yeah. Right. yeah. So if we can add up cylinders, why can't we add up pentagons in that way? Because the pentagons, when you actually added them up, the sum was five inside the pentagon, but it was not, okay. you know, it had these other values and they would interfere, right? The thing with the cylinders is that it wouldn't interfere. Right. Okay. So now let's take a look at this figure. This is a checkerboard, right? And a naive one, one layer head a neural network is going to take infinite neurons for this guy. I'm going to go a little over time. Just bear with me. I'm talking very slowly, okay? But then if I do this with two hidden layers, I can do this with only 56 neurons. Uh, actually, 57, right? Why is that? Because... The first layer will have 16 neurons. Observe that this whole board is composed of eight lines this way and eight lines this way. So I need 16 neurons, one for each of the eight lines. Then from those neurons, there are 40 squares. Now, there are actually 80 squares. 40 of them are yellow. So I need 40 neurons in the second layer to pick each of those squares. And then I can patch them up, right? I can, I can uh, patch them up on top and that's going to give me 57 total neurons. And so once I had two layers, this actually became uh, very uh, uh, composable. But then, this is just, even so, it turns out this is just y1, x or y2, x or y3, x or y4, right? So if I do this with greater depth, it's going to take, there are 16 neurons, it's going to take 61 neurons in all. If I do this as an XOR circuit, actually fewer, if I do the XOR with just two gates, right? So this didn't help in this case. It went, actually went up from 57 to 61. But then let's look at a more complex figure. This guy, if again, if, this is, if I do this naively, it's going to take a, an absurd number of neurons if I just use one hidden layer. If I do this using two, this has 64 lines. So I need 64 neurons in the first layer. I need 544 neurons in the second layer to capture all the yellow regions. And then a final one on top. So 609 total neurons is going to capture this, 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 this checkerboard. But as an XOR, this will just take 253 neurons, actually much lesser. It's, I have 64 lines, so it's going to actually take 129 neurons if I do this with the two neuron version of the XOR, right? So uh, the difference in size between the deeper 
optimal network and the shallower nets increases with the dimensionality of the input and the inc and increasing pattern complexity. Okay. Now, so the depth of neurons required in a shallow network is potentially exponential in the dimensionality of the input. This is the worst case. Whereas, or exponential in the number of statistically independent features in your input. If you just want one hidden layer or a finite number of layers, but if you let the input, the size of the network become, depth of the network increase with the dimensionality of the input, the network size is going to be much, much, much smaller. So here's the story so far. MLPs are universal Boolean machines. They are universal classification functions, but a single layer, hidden layer network could require an arbitrary numberly large number of neurons. Whereas if you increase the depth, then they could be exponentially more smaller. In other words, deeper networks are, are uh, far more expressive. The moment you add a depth to a network, then they can actually model much more complex functions. Right? Now, there's also this MLPs as universal approximators. We already saw how an MLP can model any one-dimensional function of one-dimensional input. We saw this in the last class. I can two use, use two hidden neurons on a, on a scalar input, and I can produce an output, which is a step function. And then if I want an arbitrary function, I can pack a whole lot of these steps together. I can model this function to arbitrary precision, right? But suppose I want to have an input in multiple dimensions, then I, this simple trick is not going to work. I'm actually going to have to use cylinders. So what I can do is, remember, an MLP can compose a cylinder with n over 2 in the circle and 0 outside. So now I can pack the space with cylinders and have their heights be different and add them up. And I can approximate any function to arbitrary precision by packing cylinders using just one hidden layer, as before. Right? So. Uh, here I'm just adding the sums. I'm not, I don't have an additional activation. If I had an additional activation at the output, it kind of changes the nature of the circuit. If I have an activation over here, then these activation functions have some ranges in the output. So what the MLP really is, is a universal approximator for any function from the domain, from a given domain to the range of the activation at the output. So for example, if I, were, if I were using threshold activations, then you end up with this Boolean approximate, universal Boolean machine. If I'm using uh, a sigmoid, then it's actually going to be, it can map, compute any function which goes from your input space to a number between zero and one. If I'm using something like a tan H, it can map model any function that goes from the input to, to, to that takes any maps from the inputs to the range minus one, one. If I'm using a ReLU, it can model any function where the outputs are strictly non-negative, right? But these are universal functions. So, Emma, if you want a function that changes from negative infinity to then you wouldn't have an activation. That's it, right? It's a linear activation, so to speak. So, the MLP is a universal approximator for the entire class of functions or maps that it represents. Now, this is final bit of the, the discussion of depth versus optimal depth versus width. Now, the previous discussion, questions, anyone? No, OK. So uh, the previous discussion showed that a single hidden layer MLP is a universal function approximator. It can approximate any function to arbitrary precision, but may require infinite neurons in the one hidden layer. More generally, deeper networks will require far fewer network neurons for the same approximation error. We've seen this. But there's something called sufficiency of architecture. The architecture must have, must be sufficient. What do I mean by this? The network can represent any function provided it has the capacity to model the function. It must be sufficiently broad and sufficiently deep. And if you don't have, if you don't have the requisite breadth or depth, it cannot model your function. And let's see why. Look at this figure, right? This neuron, this, this thing can be, uh, accurately represented using a network that has 16 neurons in the first layer, assuming threshold activations, right? But suppose I give you only eight neurons in the first layer. I'm still assuming threshold activations. 
can I model that checkerboard? No, because I only get eight lines, right? So if I'm only getting eight lines, it, it can be like so. This means that I'm able to tell you whether I'm to the left or the right of each of the lines. But between the lines, I cannot tell you how far away you are from the line, right? Specifically, if all of my eight lines are in this direction, I have no information left about what happens in the other direction. Even if, I, if my eight neurons over here actually capture cross hashes, I still cannot tell you. I can tell you for each line whether you're to this side or to this side. But within each of those diamonds, I cannot tell you where you are, right? So by the time the information has passed, gone past the first layer in your network, you have lost all the information required to make finer distinctions. It doesn't matter if you add infinite neurons to the next layer, the information is not there. You have lost it, right? In order to capture this pattern, you needed 16 neurons in the first layer. Otherwise, you were never going to do it. Make sense, right? So also, in the second layer, uh, now, uh, just continuing on, on this one thing here, right? So uh, let's skip this. We'll get back to this topic, OK? What can we do? Can yeah. send information directly to by, bypassing a layer? We'll get back to that, OK, right. So. But if you're speaking of layered, you have this restriction. There's, there are other things you can do, right? Now, similarly, even if I have 16 neurons in the first layer, but I have fewer than 40 neurons in the second layer, I cannot capture this function, right? Because I need 40 squares. If I, uh, and I'm going to lose some of it. So in other words, every layer, it doesn't matter how many more layers I add. If I have only 30 neurons in the second layer, even after having 16 in the first, I can have 500 neurons layers afterwards, each of them with 5 million neurons. You are not capturing this function, right? So this is not all architectures can represent any function. The network has to be sufficiently wide at each layer and sufficiently deep, right? So as you reduce the depth, the layer width is going to increase dramatically. Now, let's go back to why I cannot actually, if I have only eight neurons in the first layer, I cannot actually con construct this pattern. And it has to do with the fact that, just consider this example with only four neurons. This first neuron maybe captures this first line. So it's going to tell you whether you're to the left or to the right, right? The second neuron captures the second line. It's going to tell you if you're to the left or to the right. So between those four neurons, you're able to distinguish these five strips. But within each strip, you cannot say how far away you are from the boundaries. If the next layer had that information, then you can recover. But that information is not there. It's gone, right? Why did that happen? Anyone? We are using threshold gates, right? Suppose I were using sigmoids. When I use sigmoids, it's telling you how far, gives you some information about how far you are from the boundary. And that means even if I have only four neurons in the first layer, I'm still passing you enough information to gather, recover other boundaries, but in the same direction. The orthogonal directions are still going to be lost, right? So you're going to have to depend on how it actually learns things, but let's not worry about that, right? You, 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 even within the partial information that you're getting, you can actually uh, if you have a sigmoid instead of a threshold, you can hope to recover. But a sigmoid is still not good enough. Why? A sigmoid saturates to within arithmetic precision very quickly. So which means that, you know, for a small region close to the boundary, you're going to be able to tell how far away you are from the boundary. But if the boundaries are far away, you're going to lose it. Right? So what can you do? You, what you are really interested in is a mechanism that captures the boundary. The rest of it is just, just happens to be you know, details, right? So I could use other activations, which nonlinear activations, which continue to retain information about how far away you are from the boundary. So if I were using something like a rectified linear unit or a soft plus, then 
I can actually say how far away you are from the boundary from each boundary, which means that even if I have less than the minimum required number of neurons, if I were using threshold gates, there's still enough information being passed through that you can hope to recover some of the patterns, right? What is the, it's still not perfect. What are we missing over here? This simple figure should tell you. The other, the other dimension, right? You need to be capturing sufficient variety of information even on the lower dimensions. You have to cover all dimensions, otherwise you're not gonna be able to recover this. But modulo that, provided you have the appropriate activations, you can hope for information to be uh, recovered in, in later layers. Now, a uh, rectified linear unit has a problem. It only carries information on this side, but on the other side, it's still lost, right? So you have other kinds of activations like this guy here, which is the leaky relu, which gives you information, but at different rates on both sides of the uh, neuron. And you can see why that's going to be a advantage over a simple relu, right? Because you're carrying, transmitting information on both sides, which means that even if you are less than the critical size in any layer, you still have enough information left to recover stuff downstream. And so that's where the other activations come in. So narrow layers can still pass information to subsequent layers if the activation function is sufficiently grade, graded, but will require uh, greater depth to, per, to allow permit layer, later layers to capture patterns. So going back to this notion of the sufficiency of an architecture, right? The capacity of the network has various dimensions. What can a network represent? Now, when I'm speaking of what can a network represent, I'm speaking in the abstract. I have this architecture. What are the various functions? You're allowed to modify the weights, the parameters in any which way. Then what can it represent? What are the kinds of uh, functions it can represent? And so there are different ways of defining it. Uh, there's uh, one way to think about it is how many patterns can it remember? How many of you are familiar with the notion of a VC dimension? A small number, most of you aren't. So uh, there's, a, I won't get into that, but uh, the VC dimension of the network sort of models the complexity of the patterns that the network can actually capture. And the VC dimension of the network is supposedly bounded by the square of the uh, number of weights in the network. Uh, from our perspective, the, uh, you know, the capacity of, of a network is going to be the number of disconnected, uh, disconnected uh, convex regions it can represent. And that, again, is going to be dependent on the width and depth of the network, right? And so it depends on the architecture and the size. And a network with insufficient capacity cannot exactly model a function that requires more than a minimum number of convex hulls than the capacity of the network itself, right? But can approximate it with error. So uh, there's a whole notion of the, the uh, capacity of a network in terms of uh, VC dimension that we won't actually discuss, but maybe in a later lecture, we're going to invoke at least one of these concepts just as, just, just as an illustration. And by that time, maybe we can post you some links on what a VC dimension really means so you are better prepared to actually understand what we talk about. But you have all of these nice papers, Quinone and some tag. Uh, who show that for linear or threshold units, VC dimension is proportional to the number of weights, and this is actually very trivial to show. Uh, these guys, uh, Batlet et al., show that uh, for piecewise linear networks, then you have a more complex function for VC dimension. Uh, Gerald Friedland, I hope to bring him down for a guest lecture. He, he and Krell have some really nice work where they talk about it in terms of the information capacity and bits and they have some very nice uh, results where they show that the VC dimension of a threshold net is order mk, where m is the number of hidden neurons, and, and k is the weight of the neurons, and the math is so trivial. Uh, it kind of uh, makes sense. Now, uh, these results are highly abstract, but often come back to uh, be relevant when you're trying to model a problem of a specific complexity. Uh, more generally, all of the lessons that we've seen today are things that are worth remembering because you're, the kind of function that you're trying to model 
is going to require networks of a specific kind of capacity. And we know that this depends, this is going to be dependent on the width of the individual layers, the depth of the network, but also on the activation functions that you use. So we saw that you can trade off depth for width, but for any given activation function, there's only so far you can go with this trade-off. Some activations allow you greater depth, greater trade-offs than others. Like in the case of the threshold, the trade-off trade is pretty uh, steep, right? Uh, and these are all things that we actually have to worry about when we begin modeling our, uh, our uh, problems. So here's the last slide. These are the lessons you've learned today. MLPs are Boolean function, universal Boolean functions, the universal classifiers, the universal function approximators. A single MLP can approximate anything to arbitrary precision, but could be exponentially or infinitely wide uh, in, in its input size. Deeper MLPs can achieve the same precision with far fewer neurons. In other words, they're more expressive. They can represent more complex functions. So in the next class, which is going to be on Wednesday, we're going to get start with the business of what we've seen so far is that we've, we know MLPs can emulate any function. That's just a hypothetical situation, the theory, right? How do you make it emulate a specific function? How do you set the parameters? So this is this business of uh, training an MLP so, so that it can take images and produce transcriptions or whatever else. That's what we will begin with in the next class.